turn them off, so they should be still running. Okay. And somebody just asked me what was the subject I was going to discuss today. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there are a series of talks that I would like to start uh, giving, which will probably take quite a few months to deliver, um, all regarding um, what happens when you die. And, and, uh, and then what happens if life in each sphere of the spirit world, so the first sphere, the second sphere, third sphere, fourth sphere, and so forth, right? I don't know if it's a guidebook, but... <laughs> um, just to give you a heads up, really. Uh, no, on the physical plane it's obviously a fair bit different, but um, it'll give you an idea of what kind of truths you normally learn in each sphere of the spirit world compared. See, here on earth you can learn anything at any time. So you can learn a truth about the 22nd sphere and actually uh, the 21st sphere, grasp it emotionally just as easily as you can about learning a, an emotion in, the, say, about the 7th sphere or whatever. Well, when I say just as easily, that's probably not the truth because obviously there are certain emotions that you need to process before you can access others so so there's a sort of a sequence involved to them to a degree but um, the beauty of uh, of talking to you about it is that we also get to speak with the spirits that are with you about it because many of the spirits who come along to these sessions are have a lot of uh, feelings of um, like they don't know why they are, where they are, and all that kind of stuff. And I would definitely like to help them address some of that as well. So besides yourself gaining knowledge, it would be helpful. And I think we need some batteries, do we, guys? OK. Um, yeah, so th you could call this uh, talk uh, part of a Spirit Life series of talks that I'm going to give. And the first in the sessions, and I, I don't know if I'm going to cover the subject completely in this session or not, uh, but the first of the session is what happens when you die? And then it'll be what happens after you've died, after a bit of time, and then it'll be what happens after you've done some progression and you get into the second sphere or the third sphere and so forth. Now, of course, for many of you, if you progress uh, and work through your stuff as we've been talking about over the last couple of years, you'll actually find that what happens when you die is going to be very, very different to what's happened historically when people die. Right? Because, because of the soul condition of people on earth, if you raise your condition, and we'll talk about this in a minute, then of course, what happens when you pass is going to be very, very different than what it could have been if you hadn't dealt with those groups of emotions. So what we want to do firstly is remember the basics, and that is, here's our soul. What's our soul full of? It's emotions, longings, but let's start using some other things it's full of. Beliefs which are all emotional, right? So we have fears, they're all emotional. Sorry? Attachments, very good, yeah. Emotional attachments we have to other people, other things, life, our life, even, like, many of you are very attached to your car. You know the proof of that? You wait, you go to a car park and have someone key it along the side and you'll see how attached you are. <laughs> so, so there's attachments there, emotional attachments. Addictions, okay. All right, so we might be, well, imagine if you're addicted to alcohol or you're addicted to drugs. Well, that's a physical addiction. What about emotional addictions? Let's say I'm addicted to controlling my children's life. That's, a, that's an addiction too, right? They're all different addictions that we might have. I'll just get my mic. Right? So they're all different addictions and uh, they all have an effect uh, when we pass. Now, we could keep going there, couldn't we? But let's label all of that one thing. Let's call it all soul condition. The, 
the truth of when you pass, the truth about when you pass is all based on this one thing. And that is, my soul condition determines everything that will happen the moment of my passing. And it includes how you pass, actually. Your soul condition also controls that as well. It controls how you pass, when you pass, what happens when you're passing, and then what happens after you've passed. So it's, a, it's everything, really, your soul condition. But you throughout your life have had many experiences, right? You've had many friends, haven't you? Some of which have come and some have gone and some you've had new ones come along and, and once you met me, you didn't have many new ones come No, that's not true. <laughs> you had a lot more new ones come along then, didn't you? A lot of different ones. And, and all of those things add to the experiences of your soul, don't they? Does that make sense? So, so you even have experiences that we could add in here, couldn't you? That is now in your soul. Now obviously the experiences that we have are very different depending on how long we live, where we live and what kind of background and upbringing we've had and all those kind of things all have a huge influence on our experiences, don't they? And they also therefore have a huge influence on our soul condition. Right? So the sum total of all of these things adding together creates the soul condition and the soul condition generates our own death and what happens after we pass. And when I say generates our own death, I mean that literally. It's our own soul condition that causes our own body to degenerate over a period of time that creates its own death, assuming that we don't have an accident. But if we have an accident, it's our soul condition that attracts those accidents. Everything to do with our soul condition attracts our life, including the process of our passing, if we could call it that. So rather than calling it what happens when you die, we're really referring there, aren't we, to the physical body dying. And that's not you dying. That's just the physical body going into a separated state. So let's go through, what we're going to do is just go through some of the things that happen to you physically when you die and then what happens to you in terms of how your life, what is created in your life. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah you can just leave them running actually during the breaks. We just trim it out anyway. Okay, so is there any questions up to now? There's lots of questions, guys. <laughs> right, yeah. Oh. Um, you got the mic there with you? When we were in the car coming down here today, Alwyn said she wanted to know what happened to Lawrence of Arabia when he passed. We both read uh, the book... Um, Postmortem Post journal. journal. Yep. And he was a warrior, and he killed a whole lot of people and did a whole lot of really nasty things. And yep. that book is all about all these very uplifting things that happened to him when he got to the other side. So we were discussing that and have a lot of questions about it. Yep. Well, the truth is, um, you mustn't have read the first bit of his book. Yeah, because he can't remember it either. <laughs> In the first bit of his book, he actually describes the first period of his time in the spirit world that he can't even remember. He was so in such a bad condition. Yeah. And he only describes from the time he can remember onwards. Uh, and the truth is that he was obviously still shutting down a lot of his memories, even when he channeled the material. Does that make sense? Yep. So if you read the start of the book, you'll notice that I think he says a period of seven years he was just in a stupor, yeah. like a pain, a pain stupor, he described it as, that he, he has no desire to ever recollect. And that's why he doesn't tell you about it. Yeah. So any other questions? There is more. If we have a mic over here. Is it, where's the other mic? Is it? Um, when my father died, I thought his death was quite okay. Unless I've got a big judgment about him, I think he's not a good 
person. And um, when you say his death was okay, what do you mean by that, Rolene? Um, he he didn't care about us, but we all were around him for years just before his death and at, at his death. And as far as an onlooker would see it as, um, he had what you call a loving family around him and he got all the, the right things, if you know what I mean. And his actual physical discomfort that I'm aware of was very short. How did, how did he create that? He created that by being a despot all of his life, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. So what, how he created that situation at his passing. And by the way, that's not what he's like now. No. That's just the process of just before he died. Yeah. The reason why he created that way is he, he was a despot to the rest of his family and the yeah. rest of the family, you were all so afraid of him. What else were you going to do? Were you going to not be there? I, I, I see myself now. At the time, I thought I was just um, being okay, but I was, I was still pleasing him. Exactly. Yeah. The whole of the family was still pleasing him. Yeah. And this is what happens to despots often, is that they create an environment through a law of attraction where the family fears them so much that everybody surrounds them when they die but none of them actually feel anything for them. Well, I thought I did, whether I did or not. I, I, mean, I, I mean in a loving way. Like they feel a lot of fear and they feel a lot of other emotions. They feel a lot of anger often as well towards him about what they've done to their life and all of those things, which, by the way, he feels the instant he passes. Yeah, I, I think he does now, yeah, mm. definitely. Yep. So we want to be very, very careful. When I say your soul attraction creates even the way you die, that is a truth in, your, in his case, do you see? It's his soul attractions, which are him becoming an arrogant, uh, autocratic, uh, male, chauvinistic male through his life that then attracted a heap of women who were in a fear-based state who needed to help him and support him. They helped him and supported him through his death as well. Does that make sense? But the instant he passes in the spirit world, now he's going to have a very different life, very different life to that. And, uh, and his soul condition, so while his soul condition created that life up to that point, it was also the soul condition of others bending to him. That Because the truth is, if, if all of you had followed your passions and desires properly, none of you would have been there at his death. None of you. None of your family would have been there. You would have all gone like he was just a terrible man and many of you would have been really angry and upset and there's no forgiveness and most of you still haven't forgiven so there was no forgiveness at the time and if you were more honest with your emotion none of you would have even gone and that would have been a truer rec reflection of his own condition ironically as well yep so someone if we go up back to just keep your hand up yeah thanks Shannon um I'm not sure if you're about to cover this but um so when the soul leaves the body... Yeah, we haven't talked about that process yet. Okay, so you're still... Okay. So I'm still going to talk about that process. Okay. Is there a question you want to ask about that process? Yeah. Okay, well, yeah. how about we leave that until after we've talked about the process? Okay, yep. no worries. Is there any questions about up until the point of dying, basically, in the soul condition? Yeah. If we come over here and then down here. And if, if the person with the mic can just hand it on to the next person, that's good. Thank you. Um, just a question about that dementia situation. Where, where are they? Are they able at that point to do anything for themselves as far as changing their soul condition? A person with dementia? With dementia that are completely not with this world anymore. Well, um, the, truth, the truth is for a lot of them, they are already a lot in their sleep state. So they're already experiencing a lot of their sleep life, but they're also, most of them, are very afraid of death. And so, so because of their fear of death, they create a long life on earth where other people need to support them and care for them because they're just terrified of passing. Right? Just as if, just like they, what created their condition, their terror of feeling their own emotions created their condition of dementia. And because of that terror, they often live many years, some of them long lives after they get dementia, and, uh, and that's a sad reflection of our, firstly, our denial of emotion as a human race, but secondly, our fear of death. Because a lot of them, if they had less fear of death, that state wouldn't last anywhere near as long. So they could still be helped by celestial spirits or by our prayers? Um, Very difficult to, uh, yeah. to help a person with dementia, even in the spirit world, because of the depth of their fear 
and their depth of their fear of facing their own personal truth. So, so a person with dementia uh, faces a lot of obstacles when they pass uh, because of their fears that they have obtained through their life. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. And we'll talk about specific cases as to what happens to them uh, once we've had a bit of an overview of what happens generally. Because every case when you pass is very, very different because obviously the soul condition is very different. And so every case of passing will be very different as well. Thanks. Yep. Hi, Ajay. My son passed over on the 4th of January of this year. Yep. Um, what was very, his age, you mind? He just turned 21. 21. In his sleep, um, they had to do an autopsy because there's no idea why he died. He just sort of passed without any... Uh, peacefully. Yeah. Um, and without any seeming, like, problem. No, no problems. Very yep. healthy. He was um, slightly intellectually handicapped, yep. uh, disabled. Um, loving person. That's why I'm confused about the soul condition. Yep. Well, firstly, you're looking at death as a problem whereas I don't look at it as a problem. Uh, there are many beautiful experiences that happen uh, during the process of passing. I'd, I'd suggest to you your son being partially handicapped would, have probably, would probably much prefer his life in the spirit world than he would prefer it on earth. And I've had that channel too. Yeah, too. And, and as a result of that, um, events happen through his desire. So his soul condition, remember part of his soul condition is his emotions mm -hmm. and, and desires. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and what I feel happened to him was that he did not come back to his body when the body awoke. So what happens uh, in that case is if your body attempts to awake and you don't come back to it during the process of awaking, you will automatically pass. Do you follow me? And, and this, uh, there is actually allusions to it in the Paget messages, for those of you who have read the Paget messages. Remember that um, uh, Helen said to Ned, said to Mr. Paget um, that she was afraid that she'd keep him in the spirit world too long and then he wouldn't be able to get back into his body. So I feel that's what happened to your son, actually. He overstayed his spirit. Uh, he did it by mistake, but he was enjoying himself. Yeah. And there was a, his physical body woke up and, and he wasn't connected to it and the cord snaps under those right. conditions. Yeah. Yeah, I was confused because he was very happy with his life. Here. Yeah, I feel and from him that it was a mistake, sort of like a like he didn't know that he had to come back then. Right. Um, there was a draw from his body, but because he was enjoying himself so much, mm. um, he, he just didn't respond to the draw of his mm. body. Mm. Almost everybody responds to the draw of their body as they're waking instantaneously, uh, but your son didn't. Right. Possibly because of the handicap, actually. Yeah. Mm. Okay, thank yep. you. Does that make sense? He's enjoying himself, eh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, he doesn't want to come back here. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Mum, but that's the way it goes. <laughs> yeah, um, and this is the thing we, we look upon death as a problem. We, we think of, when I say soul condition creating our death, we think, oh, that must mean I had a terrible soul condition to pass when I was 21. No, it doesn't. It can mean totally different things. There are many children who pass who obviously don't have terrible soul conditions, but they do pass because of a law of attraction. Does that make sense? Do you want to use the mic some more? I, ha I have been in a bit of turmoil because of a DVD I watched of yours that um, said that the parent's um, soul condition or, or the parent's emotional condition could actually... That is very true. Yeah. Yep. So... And, and, but you also say that you, don't, you should not carry that blame with you. You have to look at your... Just look at your soul. So what is it triggered or brought up for you? And it's triggering some of your emotions about death itself and it's triggering some of your emotions about his life on earth and what it would have been like compared to what it could have been like if he was clear intellectually. It brought up some... I there's some issues of blame that you actually have about his dis disability, self-blame? No, not... not uh it wasn't a question. <laughs> <laughs> when I think of the emotional condition I was in when I conceived him, yes. Yes. And, mm -hmm. and all you need to do is go into those emotions. 
yeah, just let yourself feel it. That's where a fair bit of your grief is, actually. Yes. And he, he, he's fine. Like, you don't need to worry about him at all. He's more worried about you than you need to worry about him, <laughs> actually. Um, so, yeah. You know. And, and can I also say, I've had a number of dreams that have been very uh, vivid yep. at where I've been with him and... Um, yeah, see, I wouldn't call those dreams. I'd call those sleep state experiences. Right. Where, and this is one thing that most people don't realise on earth too, is that every time you go to sleep at night, you spend time with people in the spirit world. Now, obviously, because of your love for your son, you're going to spend quite a lot of time with him mm. in your sleep state. Mm. I've actually asked him before going to sleep, and it's when I'm at awesome. my lowest that he seems to come to me, and that yeah. actually the next day I can see a He's huge improvement. To cheer you up. It, it would help him a lot if you can let yourself feel your grief completely. Yes. Because at yes, the moment yeah. he feels it as a pull back to mm. you all the time. Yeah, like, and I'm feeling that. I don't want to, to create that. Yeah. yeah but, like to, but if... The, I do need to release. Yeah, it's not the head stuff. Yeah. You need to just... <laughs> yeah. it's, it's the grief he's trying to make better for mum. Mm. And so if you can just release that grief and realise mm. that he's, he's all fine and you get to spend plenty of time with him in the sleep state mm. and later you will remember it all... Um, as you as you progress anyway, you'll remember it all, mm. so you won't have to worry so much about about y y the fact of his passing. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank Let you so much. Release some of those things. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, actually, no. Can we have? Can we go right up the back? Yeah, and then across the current current as well. How is it that some spirits don't realise that they've actually passed when they get there? Well, your realisation of your passing is all to do with your belief systems. So um, if, you, if you don't have any definite belief about the spirit world at all um, and you have deep attachments to the earth and you have deep attachments to your job and deep attachments to people here, um, you might not even realise you've passed. Right? If you didn't know all the information you already know, you, you might not realise your past at all because a lot of times you're drawn back through your soul condition. We'll talk about this in more detail in the, when we talk about the first fear. But you're drawn back through your condition to people on earth and you're walking around. So you'd be like you now. This is what it feels like. Often you, you have the dress that you prefer to wear or the garb you prefer, prefer to wear on because that's what your garb is, a reflection of what you desire. And you're walking around going up to people and going to talk to them and, and none of them will even see you and you go like, you go like this and what's, going, what's wrong with all of them? All of them? Everyone's in a stupor. Like nobody can see me anymore and there's a lot of confusion based emotions and that is because of our belief systems before we pass. So don't forget that when you pass the only thing that has changed is you no longer are connected to your physical body. That's the only thing that changes. You are now connected to your spirit body. You, see, you feel, when I say now connected, you always have been, but now all of your sight and all of your hearing and all of your sensory apparatus all work through your spirit body. So, so everything that happens is, spirit, is a spirit experience for you, but often you're drawn to the same people, but they're all still living on earth. And so you go up to talk to them and they don't listen to you and then some people get very frustrated and angry, you know, what's wrong with them? And then they go to their work and somebody else is sitting in their chair and what's going on there? They've taken my job away from me and, you know, and they project a lot at the people as well in this space, of course, you know, like they get anger, you know. Some of them will even go so far as to try to make objects fly across the room and whatever in order to scare the people so that they... Uh, so that they you know, go leave their their location. So, what about the person that passes into a really dark place? Wouldn't they realise that it's different? Yeah, most of them don't realise because um, because of their own dark condition before they pass. So, for instance, if you had a deep belief there is no God, there is no afterlife, there is no uh, hells, there is no any of those things, and then you passed and your condition personally was a hellish condition, but the hell doesn't look like the fire and brimstone that all of the you know, Christian religions teach you. It's dark and dingy and smelly and cold and, and all those things. You would just think somehow you got taken into a new location on earth that you know nothing about and you can't get out of. And that's what many of them feel. So, no, 
Sorry, you need to use a microphone because I can't hear you here either. Have you finished your question, sir? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so does that mean that's reincarnation when you have, you know, when you say spirits can't get through at some stage, but, you know, some religions believe that you actually, in your passing, you have a transition period and then you move into another body. Yeah. Um, so what's your take on reincarnation? You mean what is the truth on reincarnation? <laughs> um, I'm perfectly happy to tell you the truth about reincarnation. But it's not a part of what happens. What happens is there is no reincarnation as people portray it on Earth today. And it's physically impossible to reincarnate, actually, um, until a person reaches a dimension in the spirit world that's highly developed and nobody who passes ever has passed historically in that condition. So there is no reincarnation in the state that people have talked about it today. None at all. Right? And actually, when you get to the third sphere of the spirit world, you'll be told that quite definitely. But the first two dimensions of the spirit world, there's many spirits who believe in reincarnation. And they heavily influence what they try to do after they've passed. And many of them try to reincarnate. And the way they do that is they watch for a conception of a child and if they can get into that child's body along with the child's soul, they will. Right? So many children born today are actually born overcloaked as a result of that attempt, due to the beliefs of reincarnation, actually. So what, ha what often happens, and this is also the major cause of child onset diseases, because almost every child that has a disease either before birth or at birth or shortly afterwards, even right up until two, three, five, six years of age, almost all of those diseases are the result of a spirit attachment due to the parent's condition, not preventing the attachment. Right? So that child will often act like a person who has passed because they are actually being overcloaked by that spirit. Uh, and that then people then think that supports the whole view of reincarnation. Does that make sense? Oh, he seems to be like my grandpa whatever. The truth is that majority of the time, Grandpa is overcloaking him and actually determining a lot of what he does. And I've had many experiences with this uh, and that I've told you about in the past with, with children with leukaemia and things like that. And uh, many of uh, children, most children with leukaemia actually pass due to spirits overcloaking them and creating their cancers because the spirits themselves had cancer when they passed. Um, yeah, so most child onset diseases are like that. Does that answer your question? It was very brief. Uh, there is a whole discussion I've said about reincarnation, which you can listen to, which tells you the truth of reincarnation as it, as it really occurs. Um, and I think it's a four hour discussion actually that I've had on the subject. Yeah, you can download that from the net. Karen? My question's about death and dementia, but if you'd rather move on, that's okay. Fire away. Um, just that um, my mum was one of eight girls and three boys, and she's very demented. Um, like, she can't put words together, really, and there was a lot of anger for a while, which was due to two of her sisters that had died who were expressing their anger through her, though they weren't demented. But the most recent sister that died had been demented for a long time and what happened to mum almost at the time she died which was on the other side of the world she just went really sleepy and the nurses thought she was going to die for about three days and then she woke up again and I thought well maybe she's just hanging out in the spirit world with her sisters but what, what happened? A person who has dementia will often cycle in and out of the spirit world though they might occasionally wake up and you've, you, this is why it happens over a period of time generally where it, you start seeing it onset the person's really quite out of body at different times because they can't connect to their brain and they're so used to doing that and your mum obviously heavily suppressing her emotions all of her life uh, closing, which closes down areas of the brain which then means that um, she can no longer use them. When she can no longer use them, there's a tendency then to get out of her body so she can have experiences in the spirit world. And you'll often feel the soul 
and the spirit body of the person sort of going away and then coming back and then going away when you're with them. Some of you who are doctors will actually feel that process occurring quite frequently. And, um, and what happens generally is they can easily be, their bodies can easily be overtaken in that state as well by other spirits, usually family-based spirits, but often there is whole interplays of spirit against spirit through the body as well. So you have two spirits fighting with each other through the body and things like that. Um, this is why a lot of dementia patients get quite violent at times. And then you have others who go very docile, you know, although that's rarer. Um, but, but often uh, spirits heavily influence the state from that time on. Yeah. You asking specifically about what's happening with your mum? No, just, just that sleepiness for three days, which correlated to the death, but it might yep. just be what was happening on yeah, a lot of times what happens when a person is in dementia and another one of their siblings passes, is that what happened here? So when a person is in dementia and one of their siblings pass, there's a lot of spirit world discussion, you know, going on, and they'll often leave their body and come back. But, but your mum, in, in deep fear, uh, or it wasn't your mum in this case, was it? It was another sister who um, experienced this? Yeah, the sister... The demented sister died and my mum got very, very sleepy for a few And days. she's got dementia too, hasn't she? Very, yeah. yeah. So, so what, yeah, what happened, I would say, in this case, is they met in the spirit world, right, had a lot of discussions and everything, and, and perhaps I think her sister felt a bit like um, that it wasn't such a scary thing passing as what she imagined it to be, and there was a discussion with your mum about that, um, but your mum's terror caused her to want to come back to the body anyway yeah yeah so and your mum's quite terrified of death like I think she's going to live for years <laughs> in her dementia <laughs> so yeah how, how, she hasn't passed yet has she no I no. think she's gonna she's around. terrified of passing yeah I just yep. she'd rather stay in this dementia for mm -hmm. as long as she can I agree yeah you just have it sit down with her and have a talk to her about not needing to be afraid of passing. When I think she's in her sleep state? Yeah, when you feel like she might be with you, is she in a sleep state? She's now here in Australia? Yes. Um, yeah, so sit down with her. You'll feel when she's not really present in her body, she's in a sleep state then. Okay. Call her to you and talk to her right. about not needing to be afraid. Because the death-based experience is, is like, it would give her a bit more freedom actually. Yeah. Um, and although she's not, she's not happy about where she would go, this is part of her problem, she's not happy about where she'll arrive in the spirit world. Um, so, so you know that in your sleep state? Your sleep state is exactly where you would arrive in your spirit it's world? It's not exactly you know? where you arrive, but you, get, you, you finish up in your sleep state watching other people who are in the same condition as yourself okay. and seeing their bodies, and after a while you start getting a bit freaked. Because okay. you have a tendency to then look at your own in your own in a mirror, and see your own body, and go, "Whoa, that's a bit dark." You know, well, you don't go like that. You just go, you're freaked out about your own appearance, uh, and you get very frightened. And you go, "Well, where am I going to go?" Then I saw those other people. They went, "Where am I going to go?" And you get very afraid of all of that as well. And your mum, what would help your mum a lot is is knowing how to progress in the in the sleep state. And if you can talk to her about how to progress, yep. that'll reduce her fear about her state. Yep. The truth is she's not, she's not darkening her condition on earth by staying, but she's not helping it either, because she's not growing either. Yeah. I thought she was helping herself in the sleep state, but that was just me wanting to believe that. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel she's... Uh, most, people, most people with dementia have huge amounts of resistance to death because of their fear about their emotions. And, and when they look at themselves in the mirror, they can see those emotions influencing their spirit body and they become so afraid of that. And then they watch where other people with those same spirit bodies go and you know, after they get all that information, they don't want to die at all. So they just stay in this dementia state for as long as possible. And often they have other spirits keeping them alive in that place, keeping them alive because that's their will. They want to stay alive. So other spirits then just hook into that, keep them alive, keep them alive, use their body to express their rage and so forth. And that's why you get a lot of violence with dementia patients. Yep. Yeah. If you come over here. Thanks, Karen. Um, 
was that a spirit talking to me? Because just lately I, I, I had this feeling I like to ask all my friends, my family, what happened? What happened when they die? I never did that before and all of a sudden I felt, I don't well, one of the reasons why I'm having this talk is because a lot of the spirits that come along to these talks don't have any idea about why they are where they are. Yeah. They've got no idea at all. And, and many of them are in darkness, you know, they don't understand why. Some of them are not in darkness, but they just don't understand why they didn't arrive with Jesus in the, you know, in the heavens and all of those kind of things. They have mm -hmm. a lot of questions about all of those things, you see. So that's why I wanted to discuss this subject and yeah. a series of subjects as a result. Yeah, because just a month ago I started to ask everybody. It just came to me to ask people and I get so many different answers. It's quite amazing and so many people just feel it's finished, especially my family. Yeah. It's nothing, it's just completely finished. Yeah, well for those, um, many of them can't come back to the earth because yeah. they don't even have the energy to do so. Yeah, and they're in fairly dark locations in the spirit world. So we'll talk about all of that mm -hmm. as part of the process here. Is there any more questions about the condition? Sue, just down the front here if we can. I've wanted to ask for quite a long time. I wake up of a morning feeling very anxious, quite often fearful and sad. Mm -hmm. And I've wondered for a long time if that's because of my soul condition. Um, I feel for yourself it's a combination of factors. One is that uh, many of us have to walk through a, a number of dark spirits to get back to our body. And uh, that process every morning is quite frightening. Um, particularly if you imagine you have hundreds of dark spirits around your body waiting for you to come back into your body. Um, there will often be quite a lot of fear associated with that. But it also can be about your recollection of your own sleep state experiences. Some of the sleep state experiences and many of you are now having quite good sleep state experiences, right? Uh, many of you are not aware of this, but you are having quite good sleep state experiences. And, uh, and the contrast between the sleep state experience and the awake state experience is so great that sometimes you don't want to come back home to your body and you feel like a bit afraid about stepping back into your daily routine on earth because of what's happening in the spirit world. Um, so the key with all of these things is to, when you wake up, feel your fear, let yourself connect with what it's about and process that, just release that. You'll get to a point where you enjoy your life here as much as you would enjoy your life in the spirit world. And, uh, and in fact, when you're at one with God, you've, it's like a seamless world. Like your sleep date experience and your wake state experiences are mem remembered in, 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 in a, as a continuous flow. In other words, you don't, it's not like, as soon as you go to sleep, it's not like, you know how at the moment many of us go to sleep and we pass out and when we wake up, we remember we had a dream or two, but we don't remember much else. Well, you'll remember everything. So you remember floating away from your body and you go up to there's a, this area of the spirit world, which is like, uh, at the moment, condition-wise, it's like first fear condition. And... And that's the sleep state experience where people can come and visit you, you can go and visit people, you can check out things on the other side of the world, you can do all sorts of things, right? And you'll remember all of those experiences and then as your condition grows on, the, on Earth, um, you, you can be in the second sphere and do all of that, or the third sphere and do it. So you imagine progressively, you'll see your own progression even like in terms of your environment. So these are all beautiful things that can happen when you remember or allow yourself to remember. Yeah. Just behind. Um, I'm inter I wake up tired every morning. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I'd like a bus is running over you every morning? Um, maybe a large car. Just a large <laughs> car. No worries. But I want to know, it's not just people who have already passed over that you meet in the sleep state, is it? It can no. be anyone else who's asleep. Everyone else is asleep. I'm kind of wanting some proof, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I'm thinking, why don't I come back with some lovely... So why don't, why don't you get some proof? Okay. <laughs> the way you get some proof is set your intention before you go to sleep to give yourself some proof about the whole process and, uh, and see what happens. But many of you have already had the experience when you meet somebody, you feel you've already met them before and you definitely haven't, right? Well, you definitely have because you met them in your sleep state. Right? So many of you think, oh, I've got to go here, right? And you go there and all of a sudden you meet someone who you think you know, but you don't. 
Well, how did all that happen? That happened by being teed up in your sleep state. Right? And a lot of your life is actually dictated to by decisions you make in your sleep state. So. so presumably you'd be following your desires when you're in your sleep state. So you could yes. meet up with someone that you might be interested in meeting up with. Yes. Yeah. Many of you commit adultery in your sleep state. I'm serious. I was wondering about that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. And it's the sole condition that allows you to do such things. Yeah. So, you know, if you're not happy with your marriage on earth and you know you've met your soulmate in your sleep state and then you haven't dealt with the emotion of morality, you know, you'll be highly tempted to hook up with them in the sleep state and just hope you remember it. Right? <laughs> and, and sometimes you do, don't you? Like, sometimes you have the dreams that you feel like were real but you had a, a memorable sexual experience or whatever. And these are all, many of these are sleep state experiences. When many times we don't want to remember them in our wake state, that's why we don't remember much of our sleep state experiences. The truth is that you have just the same capacity to do good or evil in your sleep state as you do in your awake state, right? Be depending on your soul condition. So, so many of us cause just as much trouble in our sleep state to other people as we do in our awake state, you know? Many of us do do that. And, and it's all to do with how we feel in the end. Like, so many times when we come back to Earth, the reason why we feel tired a lot is because we're enjoying our spirit spate experience a bit more than, than we would normally. And, and what's happening on Earth is not what we would want to do. But we're not prepared to confront the fears we have to change our life. Right? And so what happens when that, when that occurs is we come back into our body and all of a sudden we feel overwhelmed with all of the fears of what we're not confronting in our own life right now and so we feel exhausted by the time we get up. Right? The truth is that when you marry up your sleep state experiences with your awake state experiences in the sense that you desire to do the same things in both experiences and you honour your desires and passions in both experiences, you'll feel a joy about coming back to your body rather than an exhaustion. Does that make sense to everyone? And of course, you, you know, you can, you, you know, you must realise that, don't you, like, you realise that that must be the case once you, once you deal with your emotions that cause you to feel tired about your awake state, then of course you're not going to be tired in your awake state. Yeah. So at the moment, one of my emotions is, I'm still, like myself and Mary are still not close to each other like we used to be, you know, like we used, like the feelings that I have are in, the, in our soul union state and in the sleep state, we are, we are almost back in a union state. In our awake state, we're like poles apart still. So every time I wake up in the morning, the first thing that hits me is this emotion of being away, away from Mary. Does that make sense? Like that's the first emotion. So you just let yourself grieve it. Let like yourself feel it right in that place. Yeah. You got another question? No. Can we go to Josh at the back? Thanks, Karen. Um, do if if you're doing if you've done terrible things on Earth, are your sleep state experiences? Are you in the hells or? Yeah. Less so, though, there's this area, um, you could call it an area of twilight, I suppose. Sometimes on Earth we've referred to it as the twilight zone. Um, but there is an area in the spirit world where in your sleep state, it's sort of like you're on an Earth-based condition. And so you're not that as conscious of what your true condition is, even in that state. There's some very good examples of this in the, the book, The Life Elysian and, and the book um, Through the Mists, where um, the writer of the book, who's in the spirit world, visit, sees his dad in the sleep state. And my suggestion is have a good read of that, because that explains a lot about the sleep state. And his dad had a bit more spiritual awareness in his sleep state than he had in his awake state, because he's obviously conscious of a lot of things that he wasn't conscious when he's on earth. One thing that you're conscious of is that you can't die, right? 
So in your sleep state, you have less fear about death than you do in your awake state, generally. Because in your sleep state, you can see that you can't die. So, so they have a lot of uh, different emotions. And so generally, a person's sleep state condition is in a bit better condition than their awake state condition, firstly. And then secondly, there is an area of the spirit world. Uh, the way Afra draws it in his books is it's like uh, the sleep state can fit into any of the spheres to a degree, but only the, the people in the sleep state can't visit those spheres, but those people in those spheres can visit the sleep state. So, so in your sleep state, you could visit a very, very bright person, a very loving person, or you could also see a very hellish person, like a very dark, mean person as well. Right? So, so it just depends a lot on what your attractions are as to where you will go. Now, some people's attractions are very different in their, in their soul in comparison to their mind. So there are many religious people who would never be drawn into something like, say, a brothel, right, on earth. But in their sleep state, they are drawn into those things because of their emotions. Does that make sense? So, so many times that actually happens as well. So our sleep state experience is not quite the same as our earth-based experience because of what we allow ourselves to do and also what awarenesses and knowledge we have in that state compared to what awarenesses and knowledge we have in our awake state. Do, um, also, do the memories of my sleep state that I have now, um, if I pass right now, uh, do, they, do the, those places that I'm hanging out, are they... Do I not go there anymore? Well, no, what happens uh, with your memories is it's very much like I've described from an emotional perspective. When you desire to emotionally remember things, you will remember things when you pass. So, so what that means is that um, if you have a desire when you pass or you don't even have an awareness of anything that's happened to you, what will happen is, uh, in the sleep state I'm talking about, what will happen is there will be a series of events that occurred leading you to the point of recollection. And uh, this is also described in the book Through the Mists, if you want to read that book. Um, there's a, Afra goes through this series of, of events which lead him to different recollections, which eventually lead him to his mother. He believed that he was not with his mother. His mother had died, I think, 40 years earlier at, at his birth. And he believed that he'd never seen her. But the moment that he met her, all of these memories of his sleep state experiences came to him of all the times that he'd spent with her in the sleep state and even what her name was in the sleep state and his name. And so they, you know, they knew everything automatically. So um, the truth is when you, have, when you pass over into your spirit life, you will get to a point eventually of a point of connection to a memory. Now, all of you have this happening to a lesser degree here on earth already. Like if, if you go to your place of birth that you might have spent the first 10 years of your life, at, for example, a whole series of memories that you never could recollect up until, you know, before you went there will come up for you. This is why it's very, very powerful on the Divine Love Path to visit where you've been. Because they are entry points of your memories that allow you to process emotions. So, for example, if you lived in a very traumatic time in England, like 35, 40 years ago, just after the war, well, 50 years ago, just after the war, and you were brought up in a certain type of environment, and you were not yet connecting with those emotions, and you can't even remember the events, my suggestion would be to go back to England, if you can afford to do it, and go and visit those locations and feel like there'll be, a, there'll be connection points. And this is what happens in the spirit world when you pass. More and more connection points happen. And some, for some people it happens very rapidly. For some people it happens over thousands of years um, because of the darkness of their own condition. Um, but the more brighter your condition, the more rapidly it occurs. The more knowledge you have of it, the more rapidly it occurs. So for Afra, it occurred within the first few weeks of his passing. He started... You know, he, he, through his desire, he did a lot of different things and was led home to his mum. And when he met his mum, all of these other things came to him as a result. And that just happened in the first few weeks of his passing. 
but it doesn't happen like that for everyone. Yeah. Karen? It's another sleep state question, or do you rather go on to the dying? Um, no, I'm happy to answer them. Um, it's quite, not infrequently, um, I feel like go through some stuff in the awake state and I don't feel much better and then like I wake up the next morning feeling a whole lot better. Now does that mean you've done stuff in the sleep state or it just takes your body yeah. a while to... What happens is there, there are certain emotions in your awake state that lock you up from dealing with the emotions in your sleep state and when you release an emotion in your awake state that opens up a whole series of memories for you then in your sleep state you begin processing those emotions generally and you can wake up like feeling really good after that and then it'll expose a lot of things in your awake state after that generally as well so it'll be this cycle going on so so also many of your uh, unhealed emotions relate to your sleep state and what you've observed in your sleep state so for example if you if you've observed um, and I've said this frequently before if you've observed your partner committing adultery in the sleep state then it'll be one of the emotions when you get on the divine love path that you'll work your way through in the sleep state right? and eventually an awareness of it will come to you in your awake state if, if it hasn't already done so yeah. the other thing that happens all the time to me is that at two or three or four in the morning is when I can think so clearly it's like you just wake up and everything's very obvious is it yeah a lot of people will have their spirit guides waking them up at around from anywhere between two and four o'clock generally yeah, that's what it feels like uh, many of that many of you are having this happen um, that is the time when you're the most Im able to be impressed upon with regard to your emotional condition and emotions that you're suppressing um, and so because you're the most relaxed you've done some REM sleep and you're now into deep sleep generally and during that phase spirits have if they wake you up in that phase they have the ability to divine love spirits have the ability to feed you a lot of your emotional injury and conditions but also to communicate with you better yeah. and so they often will do so at those hours yeah. yep we come down and down just on that one is that why you often have the most vivid dreams after that time like I often wake up between that time and then doze off again and that's when I probably have the most vivid dream many of you are already setting your soul intention to do to have dreams that that um, demonstrate to you what you're not dealing with in your awake state and yes after that period of time generally they can wake you up go to sleep wake you up that keep you in that phase where you can dream and when you dream that exposes if you allow it to the stuff that you're not dealing with in your awake state so it's a very powerful way of working through whole groups of emotions that you're denying in your awake state I had this experience um, a few years ago when I'd parted with someone and I never really um, expressed some stuff to them and, I, and it just became this really huge desire in me to say these things to them, they were nice things and it went on for quite a long time and then I had this dream and we met, I said everything I had to say and thanked him and everything and then that was it, I never felt the desire again, it just, it just went it was yeah. very vivid and really great yeah yeah what happened there was you met up with them in the sleep state said the things you needed to say now that you've satisfied yourself there was no longer the impetus to do it in your awake state and my feelings are though you could allow yourself to deal with the reasons why you didn't do it in your awake state oh, you had I had no, no contact. contact with them I didn't know where he was didn't or know where they were no Spot yeah. on. So often that attracts things in the sleep state. Yep. Ryan, thank you. There's a lot of spirits influencing this question. Um, but when we have near-death experiences, we go to this, into this, a lot of us anyway, go into this amazingly loving space. And there's a mob of them around who are really confused, who've done that, who are really confused about where they are now. Right, yep. And very good question and, and it's very important I answer this for the spirits sake as well when you're in the in a near-death experience what happens is you go out of body and generally because 
because it's at the time of your potential passing, lots of very high spirits surround you in this particular state. And when I say lots, there can be spirits from anywhere, from the second sphere to the celestial spheres surrounding you, but often there is a lot of celestial spirits in the, involved in the process of anybody's passing. And what they do is they surround you in this sort of altered state, being able to nurse you through the process of death, if you like. Now, many people then come back to the earth, back into their body, and assume that that demonstrates their true condition, which is not a valid assumption. Because what, in that place, what you've had is literally sometimes tens, if not, if not more, people surrounding you, protecting you in the place of your passing. And the reason why it's, done, it's a loving thing that's done, every time any person passes, they are surrounded by spirits who will assist them through the process of transition from their earth life to the spirit life. Now, that process of transition often goes through an intermediary phase, which we'll talk about during the course of these discussions. And the intermediary phase is like, you could think of it like almost like a hospital, where, where, where it's sort of in a fairly lovely grounds, fairly pretty place, prettier than Earth, you know, top of the first sphere condition, which is prettier than Earth, paradisaic type of condition. And, uh, and then because of the feelings of euphoria that the person who's about to pass has, they then assume that that is a reflection of their own condition. But it is not. It is a temporary place that it happens to every single person it, where it's possible to happen, and there are times when it's not, where spirits are assisting them in the process of the, trans the transition between death from, of the, from the earth and life in the spirit world. And, uh, and so we can't assume that just because we've had a lovely experience in our near-death experience, that our actual condition will brought, bring us or attract us to the same location when we actually do pass. And there are many spirits who have, who have had near-death ex experiences on Earth and then made the assumption that they would pass into the same place that they had the experiences with, and that is a gross misrepresentation of, the, of what actually happens to them. What happens when they do pass, as we'll explain in a minute uh, if we get there this, today, um, is that they, they, um, their soul condition attracts them to their true location after a period of transition. So let me ask them, Brian, if you can answer these questions. Did all of them experience a period of transition where they had a, a few days where they felt like they were in an okay place, a bit like a hospital type thing? or or? Or did they instantly go to a darker place that they that their soul drew, drew them to? Um, most of them had a sort of the, the sort of experience that you described: lovely gardens, even nice people. Everything's a lot brighter. Yeah. Everything's a lot more compassionate, even. Exactly. And then when they started to see their condition in the mirror, what happened then? Freak out. Yeah. So they looked at. Oh their... goodness! Shocking. Oh. Yeah. That's it. Very. Yeah. Yeah. So what Very happens, scary, actually. So if you imagine, if you look, if you are not aware, but you are actually deformed, like your whole body, your face, everything looks deformed, which is a mirror of your soul condition in the sweet, in the, depending on what your condition is. But for most people, when they pass, their body is quite deformed, right? It looks older than a hundred years old, their spirit body, uh, for most people, and worse than that for most people, right? When they pass. And I'm talking, when I say most people, I'm talking like 99.9% .9 of the population passes in this condition, right? So you imagine you're welcomed into a place that's got nice surroundings, you know, there's no mirrors anywhere. <laughs> and, there's a, you know, and you're surrounded by a lot of lovely, fa pretty faces and love, everyone seems lovely to you and they're real compassionate and kind and understanding and everything else. These are the people who are assisting you through the process of transition and they are in good condition. And then occasionally you will see a person who's really ugly, and sometimes more than occasionally, like quite frequently, you'll see a person that's really ugly. And you might ask the person you're with, oh, why are they looking like that for? And the person you're with will say, oh, you know, that's because of their condition and what they did on earth. And you'll go, oh, I'm glad I'm not in that condition, right? And, and you do a bit more. And then after a while you, you realise, actually, maybe you are in that condition because some of those people are looking funny at you. 
Uh, and this has been the experience. Some of them nodding at the moment. Yeah. yeah. Maybe some of these people are looking funny at you. And then, then you have a desire to look at your own condition. And when you look at your own condition, that's when you get the shock. But it's also the point where you no longer stay at the location that you were welcomed at in the spirit world. And what happens is where you stay now is you're automatically attracted through your soul to the location that, you're, that matches your soul condition. So the location you're drawn to in the spirit world will now match your very appearance. So if you look 200 years old and the skin's falling off your bone, no, it's not funny because many of these spirits, spirits have had this experience, right? So we need to not laugh at them. It's not funny. Yeah. Many of these spirits, spirits have had their flesh falling off their bones in the spirit state, I mean, their spirit flesh, if you like, falling off their bones. And, and sockets for eyes where they can barely see out of terrible, terrible, like they're hundreds and hundreds of years old but still alive and once they saw that condition they went to the same location in the spirit world where everybody else is in that same condition now if you can imagine the shock of that you get some kind of impression how most people are shocked when they pass does that make sense? how are they feeling Brian? Um. There's a smallish group of them who are, um, are, are crying right now yeah. and they're grateful for hearing the story. Now, the thing I'd like to say to them, though, is they don't have to stay in that condition. Yeah, that small group have got that. I, they, that's that's awesome. actually in their cells now. Awesome. And so their condition is just a reflection of the emotions and their beliefs and their desires and passions that are out of harmony with love and they can change those things. And they'll get plenty of assistance when they want that assistance to change. So everywhere in the spirit world, there are literally thousands of people wanting to help. So they, you know, there's many bright spirits around them who want to help them, but the process of grieving is, part, is a part of the process of change. Yeah, this crying happened, I can, yeah, yeah. I can feel it. Thank you, you. you know that feeling, Brian, that you had of the shock yeah. it'll be great for you to write down something about that because most people on earth have no idea how much they're going to get a shock a shock just now yeah. yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. and, and the, the truth is that if we knew how much we were going to get a shock the majority of us would want to change now <laughs> rather than later that's the truth yeah. right? many of you now are personally going through your own shocks right? about what your really condition is compared to what you thought it was, right? Well, you imagine passing without that knowledge. You imagine passing with the feeling that you were going to be fine, your body looks fine and everything else, and then all of a sudden, like, you've been a week or two weeks in the nice sleep state experience, which looks to be the same as your near-death experience if you had one, and then all of a sudden things start changing when you see yourself. Have they got any more questions, Ryan? They're crying. A bit, so. Yeah, the, the the yeah they also they also feel that they can help some of the others now too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The key is to realise for all of us is to realise that our condition is not as we judge it, but rather God's laws judge our condition, and God's laws don't change. Right, and this is something that we need to really bear in mind is that down here on earth, you can falsify things a fair bit, you know? Well, you, you look at what we do. Like if you're a woman, you might dress up in a nice pretty dress, put on a bit of makeup. Now you look pretty different, right? Than what you looked 10 minutes earlier. That's one way we falsify ourselves. But there's another way we do it quite frequently, and that is we have some very dark, often, desires and, and, and emotions in our soul that we refuse to acknowledge in our awake state. And imagine coming face to face with how they have harmed your body in the sleep state soon after you pass. Like, imagine that process. Very confronting process. Yeah. Whenever I come here, I always feel very shy to sort of even have contact with you, eye contact or say hello or anything, because what I, what I want to know is, what I feel is, you're seeing this really ugly, all my emotions like that, you're seeing that. 
the truth and is, and I feel so uncomfortable because I know it's all there, you know. Well, that discomfort is a reflection of the emotions you do need to heal. I yeah. agree. Yeah. Um, the the truth is, yes, that is true. A person who is in a condition of more love can see a person out of harmony with that condition. So, and you will be able to see that in others too as you progress in in love. Um, but a person in a condition of love does not judge it. Mm. And this is why many of you feel free to share about your life stories and your condition with me, because you can feel that I don't judge that condition or story. Mm. Does that make sense? Mm. And it's the same in the spirit world. The reason why these people, when they passed, were a bit shocked at where they ended up eventually was because when they were in the first place of reception, everyone was treating them nicely because everyone there was loving. Do you follow me? So because everyone is loving, everyone could treat them nicely, and so, so they, they felt that lack of judgment, they felt no judgment from them. And it was only when they actually want to see their own condition that they get immediately drawn to the place where they belong. So when you stand up there, you must have a very ugly view. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, because we've... I don't have a judgment. You don't? Because <laughs> I don't feel that you're ugly. Right. Do, do you understand? No. Well, well, how could I feel you're ugly when I can also see your pristine soul and what that feels like to me and, and your potentiality? And how can I actually feel you're ugly when I know that all of these emotions that are in you, most of them are caused by other people? And your choices that were out of harmony with love were also caused by other people's influence. So how could I feel... Do, do you see? Like, so I don't feel... Yeah, I don't feel judgmental about it at all. Um, <coughs> And, and how, could I, how could I feel judgmental when I myself have actually been in your condition? Like, you know, like I said to you before I began this, in, in this life I have been in the hell in, in that condition. If I had passed at that time, I would have passed in quite a dark space and quite ugly as well. So, you know, how can you judge then another person for being in that condition? have a mic over here. Th thanks, Brian. Just relative to spirit, we're, if we're reading the pageant messages or we're reading um, really beautiful material of that nature of a night time, are they reading it too? Or would it be helpful if we read out loud to them? Um, yeah, many spirits are reading along with you. All you need to do is invite them to read along with you. Right. The issue, though, that many of them have is they, because where they are is not like what's being described. You know, they they need help to make the transition from where they are to what is being described, and and, and it's not sufficient just to say to a person, "Go to the light," as like a lot of new age people do say. It's it's more. You'll notice if you listen to the recordings that I have posted on the internet, where I have spoke through mediums to spirits. You'll notice that I always try to connect with their emotional condition and what's going on with them emotionally and why they're in a certain condition they're in. And I always try to leave them with some positive things about what they can do about that condition. So what I try to do is help them make the transition between where they are now and where they could be if they desire to be. And, and many of them don't even have the desire to be there. And what I try to do then is give them, the, try to help them have the desire to be there. You know, encourage them to have the desire to be there, because it's, and this is a this is a problem with a lot of mediumship on the earth. A lot of mediumship on the earth is so self-focused that we're asking the spirits to give us information, and many of the spirits who are trying to give us information actually are in a worse condition or just as bad condition as we ourselves are, and so it's really pointless trying to get information from them. And when you know a truth about something in the spirit world that you firmly believe in you can have a powerful effect on their life and how they can progress and then they can assist you in that progression. So, um, yeah, my feelings are, you know, try to help, try to feel where they are now and help them come to this place where they want to at least try to get into a better condition, wherever their condition is. So if sometimes some of you will be surrounded through your law of attraction, let's say you've been abused, abused uh, sexually as a child and you're a medium. Well, some of you will be surrounded by men who have abused women on earth, right? 
Now the loving thing to do would be to help those men, and this is a part of our own process of working through our emotions, helping those men get into a better condition in the spirit world. Because at the moment they're helping other men abuse more children. right? And if we can help them get out of that state and into this new state, then all of a sudden we alleviate the pressure on lots and lots of children on the earth just by our action with those spirits. So it's really important to focus on how you can assist those spirits when you feel them around you. Yeah. And there's a lot you can do. Much more than what's being done can if, be done. If we formed groups for the purpose of doing that? Certainly. That's them? a wonderful thing to do. It's, um, I, I know with Paget, we were focused with Paget on trying to give the truth to the world, but... but he had a desire to help spirits a lot. And, and we suggested to, to him once a week that he actually just focus on helping the spirits who were dark, dark spirits, and he did that. Yeah. And many of the recorded messages in the pageant messages are those messages oh, yeah. of the spirits that he, he helped during those times. It's, it's a wonderful thing you can do. And on, honestly, often a lot more rewarding than helping a person on earth. The reason why is that many of the spirits do have a desire to progress by the time they come to you. And so it's a lot easier to help a person who has a desire to progress than it is to help a person who's really resistive. That's awesome. So Thank it's you. very powerful, yeah. So I'd suggest any of you who are mediums to really consider doing that on a regular basis. The issue you face, though, is don't get hooked on it. Because if you get hooked on it, you won't progress yourself. And if you don't progress yourself, you won't be able to help more people. You know, you'll just stay in your own condition and, you're, and, and so you yeah, don't get hooked on it, but allow, allow it to occur. I, I personally love doing it. It's just like, whenever I have the opportunity offered to me from, from a medium, I just take it in, instantly, yeah, generally. Yeah. Uh, microphone. Thank you. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, yeah, I started watching the DVDs about five months ago, and in the, one of the early ones, I can remember you suggesting uh, letting our relatives who passed know about it, and it just coincided with my having got all of the photographs of parents, uh, uncles, aunts, grandparents, out to put on a little section on the wall. Oh, yeah. So I lined them all up along the lounge, <laughs> yes. a whole lot of them, and, and just had the, had the television on. Felt really good. Awesome. I, have, yeah. I haven't done it all the time, but I just yeah. felt it enough to make that contact and explain to them why I was doing it. Yeah. And and just say, well, you know, it's going to be here, going on for a while here. Yeah. And now some of them will feel drawn to the situation because they already feel ready to know what happened. So others are not that drawn. It just depends on you know their personal circumstances and situation in the spirit world. But you'll be surprised often how many are drawn to you in that state. You know because because a lot of them arrive in the spirit world, have this terrible shock, and then wonder why it happened. And, and having some explanation of why it happened is a great, great thing. So, yeah, you'll find a lot of people... If you, if you sit down and watch the video, videos, you can even have the videos playing. I know some people do this. Have the videos playing and just invite the other spirits to come in and sit down while they do something else and just have it playing. And the, that helps every one of those spirits who are listening to that, yeah. Yes, I didn't feel too much attachment Awesome, yeah. That's wonderful. And every and I feel that quite a number of your relatives have benefited from, from it already. Yeah. Yes, I'm one in the family who's been closer to a lot of the oldies, and uh, yeah. so I think that's always... Yeah, and it's a feeling of love and respect that you have for them that draws them to, draws them to you in the first the place. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're, they're older than you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, it's nearly... It's nearly quarter six, um, and I think, hey, 15 more minutes? This is a subject that fa seems to fascinate people, isn't it? Um, and I often am fascinated about how fascinated people are about it, because to me it just seems like the same as living on Earth. But anyway, any more questions? Then? All right. Uh, I just wanted to know what happens to people who are very overcloaked on Earth um, like a lot of people with mental illness, for instance. Yep. Um, and obviously, people, a lot of normal people are, are overclothed. So, what happens to them when they? Pass a, over? It depends a little, um, but let's describe some scenarios of what happens. Let's say a person on Earth uh, was overcloaked 
and so much so that they almost became the person who overcloaked them. All right? Well, what happens the instant that you pass, the, the connection instantly severs between you and the person who's overcloaking you. Because the person who's overcloaking you, in many cases, is in even a darker condition than yourself. And, uh, and as a result of that, what often happens is the person comes back to the time when they were first overcloaked. And then there's these terrible feelings of grief that begin about having lost a large portion of your own life. And there's, often they have a lot of sadness and grief about, about that. Um, if a person has uh, been, say, like a schizophrenic or, or manic depressed, where they have a cycle of being overcloaked and a downers, cycle of being overcloaked downers, it's actually the down period that their life will mirror once they pass. So, so, which is scary in itself, right? Which is the reason why they allow the overcloaking. So, yes, yeah, this cycle that occurs. And so the down periods of time, which is where the person's real condition is, um, are often heavily affected. Um, and they often pass in terrible, like a terribly depressed state, uh, suppressing huge amounts of rage. Um, so that's what happens to many people who have manic depression. With schizophrenia, it's a little different because you often have five or six or 10 or 20 spirits surrounding you. And, it, and those spirits all have less impact on you as soon as you pass. But then you've got to come face to face with the fact that most of your life wasn't your own. So there's a lot of emotions associated with that. Um, if you're uh, overcloaked and you wanted it, which many today are in that condition, where they um, had a, what they call a life-changing experience, where now they've become a guru in this twinkling of an eye, <laughs> you know, um, uh, then the spirit who was connected to you will be disconnected, will, will disconnect from you. But often the spirit is in a higher condition than yourself, and so they will often try to visit you, but because you believed it was yourself, you won't often recognise them. All right? So again, it gets back to what happened in the interactions uh, with the spirits involved. Um, but for almost everyone who has some degree of being overcloaked, there is a huge... Uh, there is huge feelings of, uh, involved in their passing as a result of it. Um, many of the people on earth who are so-called gurus and who are doing all these wonderful things, and some people are even saying that they're God and all sorts of things, and doing all these healings and wonderful things, when they pass, they are severely disappointed. And by the way, many mediums who are mediums in a new age sense are severely disappointed with their own passing because they believe their condition, their own condition to be much better than it really is. And they believe their own beliefs about the spirit world, which often come from first fear spirits. And, uh, and they're often in deep error about their own beliefs about the spirit world as well. And they often have terrible shock as well. Yeah. So I can't give a definite, definitive answer on every passing, but that gives you a bit of a summary of what happens in each case. Um, often... Everything is dependent upon the desire of the person. And when we're overcloaked, there is our desire is involved in that every single time. And those emotions, because they're not being uh, assisted anymore through the addiction, are often very rapidly exposed after our passing. So what that means then is that our own emotions finish up dictating not only the passing itself, but the separation from the spirit involved, but our own emotions are so heightened because our addiction was being helped by the spirit who was attaching to us. And now that attachment has ceased, now, now there is a terrible feeling of the addiction not being met inside of ourselves. Does that make sense? And we often go through, people go through terrible experiences emotionally in, in recognising that disconnection. Yeah. Pretty hard, eh? You can see why a lot of people are afraid of dying. Because in reality, they have a lot to be afraid of in some ways. Um, not, not that it's real, the fear, but there are a lot of very painful experiences that await them when they pass. And it's what people call hell. You know, there is a reason why the religions believe in a hell. And that is because there is hellish conditions in the spirit world where the majority of people on earth do pass into. And... and unfortunately have to work their way through. Now some work their way through it very rapidly 
others spend many thousands of years and some have even spent tens of thousands of years in the hills um, if you can imagine that yeah. it's hard to imagine yes, if we can have a mic up the back there one of the two down the front we can do some guys the other mic there's a second mic somewhere oh you've got it are you asking a question yeah go far away we'll wait for the mic to go just wait for a moment there. um i i have been trying to process my emotions with my father um they oscillate between rage and really, really um, uh, neutral, like and rage numbing. And really, really rage. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and then I go into numbness like, no, that can't be. So it's like a denial that I'm aware of. Yep. Um, but it's it, because I just keep working at it. Now, what I have is the question is, if, I'm, if I can do things in my sleep state that are negative as well as positive, um, because I'm not getting through my emotions with my father and I'm angry, so that's a denial, when I go into a sleep state, do I, unbeknownst to me in my wake state, go there and give him hell? Do I do that? Well, you're already doing it in your wake state, so it's highly likely you'll do it in your sleep state. Because when you say you're in a rage with him in your awake state, you are giving him hell, as the saying goes, yeah. in that state. You see, here's you. It doesn't matter whether on earth or in the sleep state. Here's you. Here's your dad. Right? And, and what happens is every time you interact with him at the moment, what he's feeling from your soul is your rage. Right? So there's just rage. Now, him at the moment wants to defend that. You know, so he just gets in a rage back. You know? It doesn't help any of you. Right, really do anything about it but that's what he feels he, he wants to rage to you and you want to rage to him but nothing really changes in that state and yes highly likely you'll do that in your sleep state because you're doing it in your awake state so my suggestion is to go further into the grief relating to dad and the fear relating to dad than the rage Yes, I, I have been trying to go to the grief, I know, I know. Um, and it sometimes goes there, but then it comes out. And um, so, can I suggest though you want, and this applies to many of you who are in rages with other people, you want to stay in the rage, yeah. because in your rage you can punish them, and you want to punish them, and in your rage you can blame them, and you want to blame them, and in your rage you want to make them suffer and you can make them suffer that's the whole point now what we need to do is give up those desires and when we give up those desires we'll give up the rage does that make sense to everyone when we give up the rage we can now enter the fear and the sadness that's within ourselves and ironically that's the thing that's going to actually affect them more that's when they probably will get into some form of repentance about what they've done they're not going to get into a state of repentance while you're raging with them. Do you ever get into a state of repentance when somebody rages at you? What do you do most of the time when someone rages at you? Rage back many times, isn't it? So how can you expect someone in a darker condition to yourself that caused your pain to actually do anything different other than rage back? Can you see? Right. So what we need to do instead is relinquish the desires. Every one of these desires has an emotion attached to it. So if I want to punish someone, why do I want it? There's an emotion aside. Do I want to blame them? There's an emotion in that. Do I want to make them suffer? There's an emotion in me in that. And I need to release those emotions and then my rage will dissipate. Could you just go to take one, let's say, punish? What yep. is the emotion related to punish then? Well, it's different for every person isn't it? Because it depends what's been done to you by that person as to why you want to punish them. Does that make sense? So if that person had, uh, if that person had only stolen your house, yeah. then you might want to do a totally different thing to them compared to if they had actually uh, sexually abused you as a child. Can you oh, see the difference? I see. So, so my desire to punish them will be based on different emotions, based on what they have personally done to me. Did you see that? Yes, yeah, so, but how do I get past that? Because when I'm actually doing things to try and process it, um, I keep going back and repeating the same thing, trying to get out of it. So all you need to do is feel what that person did to you, right? Yeah. But now feel it 
inside of you instead of as a rage. So in other words, feel it as grief or terror rather than as a rage. Yeah, I, I try to do that. But what no, am no, I not? No, I'm, I'm not. saying okay. if you have to try to do that, yeah. you need to focus on these emotions because, because once those emotions dissipate, you won't need to try to do it. Okay. It will automatically happen. Does that make sense to everyone? It's like, like while I'm holding on to the desire to punish someone, do I want to give up my rage? No. While I'm holding on to my desire to blame someone, do I want to give up my rage? No. While I'm holding on to my desire to make them suffer, do I want to give up my sadness? No. Because if I give up my sadness, then I won't feel like making them suffer anymore. And I feel like they deserve to suffer for what they did. And I feel like they should suffer. Do you know what I mean? So we need to give up these emotions and then the rage will dissipate and then ironically we'll get to our own grief which is what we need to do to heal ourselves yeah yeah so that makes sense a little bit yeah and um, there was someone up the back yeah there we go thanks aj when somebody passes into the spirit world or i in this case pass into the spirit world will i then get to meet in this case my father who i've never known and my mother as well, but my father never saw me, like, after I was born. Does can, I, can I suggest to you, your yeah. father's already passed, hasn't he? I don't know. Don't know. I feel he has. But. Yeah, I feel so too, but yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Um, can I suggest to you that you've been meeting him ever since he's passed in the sleep state? And what will come to you is a recollection of those events. Does that make sense? Thank you, yeah, because I felt maybe my mother had passed when I was 11 weeks and maybe when he passed she may have pointed him out, me out to him. So stop, he's stop talking. Sorry. Stop talking. <laughs> Feel your emotions. Yeah, you just about had an emotion. I, I know. And I, it, was, it was just yeah, there. Your, what your father was doing then, and I just want to say that to you, is what your father was doing then was confirming to you that he does talk to you when you go to sleep. And, and you don't let yourself grieve this now. Like, just let yourself grieve that. Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it wonderful that he does that? Thank you. Yeah. So let yourself feel that. That's fine to feel that. Yeah. Okay, if we can bring a mic down to Linda, isn't it? There's one coming down, Linda. Sadness, isn't that grief? Um, yeah, I, I call it grief because uh, oftentimes we feel grief is deeper than sadness. Like, if you can imagine for a moment, a lot of people say, oh, I feel sad. And they're not crying at all, right? right? Well, all I'm saying is that when you really feel sad, you'll be grieving, just like a person who's, who's just grieving a loved one dying often grieves. So you'll be wailing when you grieve. And I often use the word grief to indicate the difference in the emotional intensity of what we need to feel. But yes, I believe that sadness. Yeah, it's the same, same emotion. Yeah. Any other questions? Jeez, quarter of an hour goes pretty quick, guys. Hello. How are you doing? Okay. <laughs> just hold um, the mic up a bit closer. That's it. I was just wondering when you were talking before about um, like being in a state where you can see, really see people and their soul condition. Um, what do you see? Like, is it kind of colours or like, is it? our spirit body or our spirit attachments or like what do you see? No, for me it's more um, at the moment what I'm seeing is just feeling you. So, but I see that as seeing you. Um, it's yeah. very hard yeah. to explain I, to most people. I but the picture of your face yeah. in your sleep state comes to me after I feel you. Do, do you understand? Like, no. no? Okay. Um, We've got some people staying with us at the moment who are just doing some work around our, our house because we never get there to do any. <laughs> and uh, and um, the the lady the lady who who's there, um, her name's Katrina. She's just started developing the sight, being able to see people's spirit bodies. So what she does is she she sits a person down the opposite to her, and she looks at them. Right? And she sort of allows her eyes to blur away from the person and all of a sudden their spirit body comes into focus. Right? And then she describes the spirit body that she sees. Right? Now that is a totally different process to what, to what I'm doing. But I'm saying that you can do that. 
Every person here can do that. So you just kind of stand there and you can feel what all of us are projecting at you, like all our different... Yeah, yeah. Is it just what we're projecting at you in particular because you're like... No. Or is it everything? Yeah. <laughs> and every, everything you're projecting at other people. And okay. And also, as a result of that, a lot of your memories, um, like the reasons why you're projecting it as well. So often when I stand in front of a person, the feeling, you can feel all of the memories that are in them that created the state they're in. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Yep. You're worried now. <laughs> I, I guess, like, that, truthfully, that's sort of why I asked the question, because I'm not sure what, what I look like, I suppose. Yeah. Or what you see me as, yeah. yeah. So I, was, I suppose that's where it came from. What I'm trying to do in these talks is help every person become more self-reflective. Because the more self-reflective you become, the less you'll need somebody else to tell you what's wrong or right with you. Does that make sense? So one of the best gifts I can ever give you is to empower yourself to see yourself truly. Now part of that, part of that is telling you the truth about the world in the spirit world and the world and how different emotions and different morality choices that we make affect our soul condition and telling you the truth of that. Does that make sense? So while I tell you the truth of that, that helps you become more self-reflective. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Um, yeah. So what, what I'm suggesting is allow the talks to help you become more self-reflective rather than wanting me or somebody else to tell you what's really going on for you all the time. Because yeah. if you can be self-reflective with God, like in particular with your relationship with God, what happens is then you see yourself like you're looking in a mirror. So you imagine you were those spirits that Brian was talking about earlier, right? Who... They, passed, they had a, they had a um, near-death experience and they had a nice, lovely experience. If they could look in the mirror in that near-death experience, that would be interesting, hey, and come to a full re reflection of their own condition. That would have been great, but that never happens generally. So they come back to Earth, they live their rest of their life, then they die, pass into the spirit world. Now they live, they live in that area, which is just that welcoming area in the spirit world which is a very pleasant area, while, while they're waiting to see themselves. Right? Now, for you, if you don't wait to see yourself and you're willing to see yourself right now, you won't have to go through that experience either. Right? Because you'll be able to see yourself and you'll know, you'll, you will expect what you see right? after a while when you can see yourself truly. So allow yourself to see yourself completely. So you know all those things you feel ashamed about? Yeah, that's a part of you too. At yep. the moment, I feel like I don't trust myself. Yep. Like I Which is why you asked the question. Yeah, yeah, because I keep... I feel like I keep crying about effects and like I just don't trust that, that what I'm growing. feeling is even real. Like, I'm not going anywhere. Yep. Yeah. And remember, I've said to you frequently that if you, if you, have, if you are grieving... Most of the time, you'll feel childlike while you're grieving. Now, if, if that's the case, then you're crying generally about causes and not effects. But if you're feeling like an adult grieving, then you are probably crying about effects and not causes. I feel like I have um, cried about a lot of causal emotions, and my law of attraction changes, but then it goes back. Then has it changed? <laughs> no, but... Does that mean that there's still more to uncover there? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Right. Allow your law of attraction to tell you what's going on like that. Yeah. But uh, getting back to the comment about how we look, um, if we can see ourselves truly now about how we look and we really see ourselves truly, then that's going to prevent any shock from the future. Does that make sense? Yeah. Quite a number of you are feeling really quite distressed. Uh, this is why he's crying. <laughs> no, it's not just it's not just you, Jim. It's not just you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's just feeling like 
the freak out of what do I look like? What do I look like going on in this room at the moment? And, uh, and he's obviously uh, feeling that quite strongly. Um, the key is to allow yourself to see what you truly look like because if you can see what you look like, you can change it. <laughs> but if you don't see what you, can look, what you look like, how can you change? It's not possible to change. And this is why, like, when I have these discussions about uh, saying to you your true condition on certain issues, some of you get really upset and angry and frustrated with me and so forth. But actually, if you could see it as a gift to see what you look like, because I, I'm not judging it, I don't feel bad about it. Like, I still feel like giving you a hug after I tell you, don't I? <laughs> so I, I don't feel like you're terrible. Right? But it is something that we need to address if we want to get closer to God and we want to get closer to each other and, we want to, and get closer to our soulmate. We want to address all of these different things, right? So allow yourself to see yourself as you truly are. When you pass into the spirit world, that will be forced upon you. So isn't it better to do it voluntarily now than waiting until it's forced upon you? Wouldn't that be better? I'm going to ask a question. Uh, you need to use the microphone. Thank you, Rachel. So when you actually are in health at Earth and you go through your feelings on Earth here while you're in that situation, mm -hmm. you don't have to risk that you end up in the health in, in anymore. No, that's right. Okay. And this is why I'm having this discussion with you is because many of you have the prospect of not even passing into the first seven spheres of the spirit world you pass into the eighth sphere or, or greater of the spirit world. You have that prospect. And you never have to go through this whole process of what it looks like in the hells and what it looks like in the second sphere and what it looks like. You can visit them, right? And check them out, but you don't have to live there, yeah. yeah. Right? So it's better to, to... But many of you will be severely impressed with the second sphere. Do you know what I mean? Like, but, but this is part of the problem when we pass too, is we get to a place that we're happy with and oh everything's breezy at that point and we don't and because and this is where your desire for God needs to be so strong that no matter how happy you are where you are that you actually still have a desire for God pulling you further towards him does that make sense yeah all the time in the pageant messages your desire for God is what's going to pull you through the entire process right and if you don't do it, if you just do it because you're afraid of what you look like, then you'll get to the second sphere and you'll walk around with a good body. And, you know, like, you'll even maybe strip half of it off to show the others, you know, like, and, you know, like a beach person would do. And, and feel pretty good about yourself, but, but you'll stagnate in that place, not realising the bliss and happiness that is ahead of that place. If you, if you don't have that longing for God driving you in your choices and decisions. So if you have a longing for God driving you now, what will happen is that uh, that longing that you've developed now inside of yourself will just increase, 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 increase. And by the time you pass, you'll not only pass into a good state, but on top of that, you'll have a burning desire to keep progressing. right? And you'll do that without fear. But if you decide to do it for some other reason, like you want your your face to look nice when you pass uh, rather than any other reason then what will probably happen is your face might look better after you deal with some of the motions and you might pass into the second sphere or something like that and you might feel quite content with that location because that kind of location is certainly a better location than what's here on earth but, but you won't experience the bliss that I'm describing to you that comes from the other conditions above that condition right? so if we can allow ourselves to, to, to uh, focus on our relationship with God will draw, drawing us through these conditions. Now, I'll finish now because it's after six now. Um, what we'll do is I'll have more discussions about spirit life. Uh, I want to spend quite a bit of time on the first sphere and the hills in the first sphere, uh, just for the sake of many of the spirits that are with us, uh, around us, and also for the sake of you helping other people uh, in the spirit world as well. Uh, because there are literally billions of spirits in those places in the spirit world. And we want to talk about how they influence us and all those kind of things and why they do it and have some compassion for them. Many of you, when you're told that you're being overcloaked by a spirit, you get just nasty with the spirit. 
Um, that's not having compassion for them. You know, the Spirit's only doing what you want them to do uh, in the sense that your soul wants them to do. So allow yourself to feel some compassion and, and it's knowledge that in the end gives us a lot of compassion. You know, when you see what's really going on, you get a lot of you know, feelings of compassion for others. So the next discussion we have will be more about the a actual passing process, like what actually physically occurs to your bodies and then we'll talk about that process of your first point of arrival in the spirit world that most people go through, uh, where they don't yet see their own condition and what happens in that place where they don't yet see their condition. And uh, thank you again for your time, guys. Thank you. And, uh, and thank you for your questions, many of which were were motivated by some spirits so that thank, I'd like to thank those spirits for attending and for their questions as well which were very interesting we love you guys catch you later